Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. Would ask everyone here in-house if you'll be so kind to make that last check that cell phones have been turned off before we begin. It will be appreciated. And, of course, our Internet viewers are always <laughs> welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And we will be posting the program later on today, hopefully, at least by Monday, for your future reference on our Heritage website as well. Hosting our guest today is Matthew Spaulding. Dr. Spaulding is Vice President for American Studies and Director of our B. Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics. He is a constitutional scholar and authority on American political thought and religious liberty. He serves as a fellow at the Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Political Philosophy and is an adjunct fellow at the Kirby Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship, part of Hillsdale College. He was executive editor of the Heritage Guide to the Constitution, a line-by-line -line analysis of each clause of the Constitution, and his most recent book, We Still Hold These Truths, Rediscovering Our Principles, Reclaiming Our Future, details America's core principles, how they have come under assault by modern progressive liberalism, and offers a strategy to recover them. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Matt Spaulding. Matt? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Heritage Foundation Lehrman Auditorium. It's actually appropriate that we are in this auditorium. You might have noticed on your way in that bust of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it's one of six uh, casts from an original by Augustine St. Gaudens in 1886, and it was a gift to us from Louis Lehrman, for whom this auditorium is named. Uh, public opinion, said Lincoln, stems from a central idea, and for him, that central idea came from the Declaration of Independence and through the framework of the U.S. Constitution. To the extent that our politics are still about those ideas, it is important that we come to understand Lincoln. But to the extent our politics is about who controls the meaning of those ideas, that is, to the extent that our politics is a debate over the meaning of America, we debate Lincoln. We debate Lincoln at great length. In, indeed, given his great expression of those ideas and his wide embrace in American politics, he is debated and debated and embraced on both the left and the right. Pres President Obama has clearly made such an embrace, claiming that mantle. Uh, for liberalism, Lincoln means the opening of progress, the beginnings of equality in modern government. On the right, on the other hand, it's a little bit more confused. A topic of debate within conservatism that is often, especially in past years, played out sometimes quite hotly in the pages of National Review magazine. Some dislike him for pre precisely the reasons the left embrace him. Some think he's a downright tyrant. But even among Lincoln's supporters, there is some confusion. <clears throat> Russell Kirk famously called him a conservative statesman of the high order who saved our constitutional republic. Yet he included John C. Calhoun rather than Lincoln in his book, The Conservative Mind. For our part, we believe Lincoln has much to teach us about timeless truths applicable to all men in all times, as he said of Jefferson. And at a time when conservatism is rediscovering itself, it's fitting that we turn to him and to see what he has to tell us and teach us. Indeed, it might turn out that there's more there than meets the eye, and more there to be learned that we need to learn today more than ever. Indeed, that is the point of this wonderful new book by our guest today, who understands Lincoln both in principle and in the proper context and sees Lincoln's statesmanship then and its lessons for today, especially when it comes to some very powerful ideas having to do with opportunity and mobility. Uh, Rich Lowry is a native of Virginia and a graduate of the University of Virginia. There he edited a conservative monthly paper, a magazine, The Virginia Advocate. In the summer of 1988, 1988 he was the second most important intern at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, working at Paul's Review Magazine. He was then a research assistant for Charles Krauthammer, reporter for a local paper, and that trajectory brought him to National Review in 1992. 
uh, after finishing second in an NR writing contest. He first became the NR articles editor, moved to Washington, and was their Washington uh, editor for a while, and was named editor of National Review outright in 1997 to replace the great William F. Buckley. Today, he's a syndicated columnist, writes for a wide variety of publications, is a commentator for Fox News, has written several books. His previous one, previous one, A Legacy, Paying the Price for the Clinton Years, was a New York Times bestseller. His ongoing work, his writings, his thinking, and especially this fine book he's written on the legacy of Lincoln, further establish him as one of the best writers and import, most important minds in America conservatism today. Please join me in welcoming Rich Lowry. Thank you, Matt, for that wonderful and extremely generous introduction. And thanks to the Heritage Foundation for having me here today. Thank you for all of you being here today. It's really um, it's a pleasure for me to be among friends, because I, I, I'm a right-wing guy who lives and works in left-wing New York, so that doesn't happen very often. Uh, for the longest time, I lived uh, in an area known as Union Square, which is right near NYU, and all the students of NYU. And this was, I believe, the very epicenter of Obama mania in 07 and 08. I still remember on election night in 2008, I was doing commentary on Fox News late at night. I came back uh, to the neighborhood two or three in the morning. I was um, exhausted, angry, disgusted, all the feelings you would expect upon the advent of a new era of hope and change. And uh, it was like we'd won a war in my neighborhood. Everyone was out dancing in the streets, banging pots, chanting, singing, spontaneously high-fiving people. They were high-fiving me on the sidewalks. Little did they know. And whenever I think back to this incident, I'm reminded of a Reagan story when he was governor of California and went apparently to a meeting of the Board of Trustees of the University of California. And as oftentimes happened then, uh, a spontaneous protest broke out. And there were all these kids swarmed the building. And Reagan's aides wanted to take him out around the back to avoid them. He said, no, I'm going to go right through them. He goes right through them, gets into his car. And these kind of stereotypical hippie types, unshaven, unwashed, maybe a little uh, smelly, you know, start banging on the, the car. And they're chanting, we are the future. We are the future. And Reagan um, cracks the window a little bit and says, well, in that case, I'm going to sell my bonds. Um, I've written this, this book on Lincoln. I've already had, it's, it's, it came out last week. I've already had a couple of interesting experiences on the, my book tour. One, uh, my wife and I live in a doorman building in Manhattan, and we have a wonderful uh, doorman who, he's an immigrant from Ireland, a really hardworking guy. I just recently had a kid. Basically, from asides that we hear from him occasionally, we think he has conservative instincts. And I gave him my book. He was delighted to get it and very encouraging. And then he looked a little more closely at the cover, and he said, wait a minute. You wrote a book on Lincoln? I thought you were a Republican, which, uh, and this wasn't a jibe at me. This was a sincere inquiry. <laughs> so this, this shows we have some work to do here. Um, and uh, the other thing that happened is I was out in California earlier this week, and I was on the Wi-Fi in the plane checking my email, and I get this um, panicked one-line email uh, from my wife saying, did you use our credit card to buy $500 worth at Walmart? And I'm really book obsessed at the moment. So I thought she was asking me if I had bought $500 worth <laughs> of the book on our credit card at Walmart. And I thought, look, I'm a desperate author, but I'm not quite <laughs> that desperate. Uh, and you think about it, it turned out to be a fraudulent charge that bought something else. But it really would be the perfect crime if someone stole an author's credit card to buy, to buy his books with. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Lincoln. Uh, I think it's so important to get Lincoln right. Uh, for two reasons. One, we've had this century-long effort on the part of the left to make him into uh, a proto-progressive, as, as um, was referred to earlier. And two, I think if you get Lincoln right, you get America right, and you get what should be our animating purposes as conservatives right. And Lincoln was um, frequently underestimated in his time. He's underestimated in some ways even today when so many people consider him a hero. There's a view of him as a common man, you know, just this tribune of the common people and common sense who is an accidental uh, president. And this is just all completely wrong. He's ferociously ambitious right from the beginning. Even as a, a youth, he was exceptionally uh, smart, 
uh, with an exceptional mind, an incredible memory. People uh, who grew up around him would say, as a kid, he was already interested in politics. He'd borrow newspapers and return them and be able to recite you know, the editorials line by line. And he had a, uh, just an exceptional judgment about people and how the world works and human nature. And he, one point he made in one of his early speeches is that you really can't influence the behavior of people with the promise of some far, far off reward or um, the threat of some far off punishment. And he told a, a story to illustrate this. He said there was an Irishman and he stole a spade, got away with stealing the spade. And someone goes up to him and says in the politically incorrect argo of the time, you know, Patty, uh, you, you stole the spade and you think you got away with it, but let me tell you, when uh, you die and you go and meet your maker, you're going to have to pay for that spade. The Irishman says, well, if you're going to credit me for that long, I'll actually, I'll take another. Um, so Lincoln, um, and one of the reasons he had this uh, great appreciation for human nature and how the world works, he was dinged up by life. He was roughed up by life. And to understand this, it goes back to the very beginning uh, in his upbringing, uh, literally with nothing, in Kentucky and then in Indiana. Uh, where his family moved to in Indiana, people reported that when they had fires going in their log cabins at night, they would see the eyes of bears shining um, outside looking through, through the uh, cabins. There is a story in this area of a little girl who was killed by a panther because her brother couldn't kill the panther quickly enough with, an atchet, with a hatchet to the skull, okay? So this is not suburban bliss. This is a very unforgiving environment. His aunt, uncle, and his mother, when he was very young, all at the same time died of something called milk sick. A cow would wander out into the forest, would eat a poisonous root. Its milk would get poisoned. No one would know this. You'd drink the milk, and you'd literally be dead in a week in a horrific horrible death. And this is how Lincoln's mom dies. He has to fashion the wooden coffin with his dad. They bury her without a sermon because there's no minister in the area. Eventually, months later, one came by and gave a, a funeral sermon. His sister would die in childbirth. This happened very often. And Lincoln's family is very mad at the in-laws saying they didn't do enough to care for her. And their explanation, which again gives you an idea of what this time and place was like, was that the nearest doctor was too drunk to, uh, to come and help her. So. Lincoln's fundamental ambition was to escape all of this, to get out of the backwoods, to end this kind of isolation so no one had to live that way um, ever again. And if you want to get a story that I think goes to the very essence of Lincoln in this regard, you know, we call him the rail splitter because it was a great uh, act of myth making when the Illinois Republicans made them. Uh, their favorite son candidate for president in 1860 where they brought, brought two rails out that he'd supposedly split when he was a young man and he has known, been known as a rail splitter ever since. It's in the subtitle of my book. It's a real misnomer. He hated splitting rails. He didn't want anything to do ever again with an axe or a maul, uh, which is what you, you use to split rails. And he told a story in the White House about when he was a young man, he had a rowboat. He had it at the side of the Ohio River. And these two gentlemen came up in a carriage, and they had luggage, and they wanted to meet a st steamboat coming down the river. So they asked Lincoln, will you row us out there? He rows them out there, helps them with the luggage. They get on the, the boat. They're about to steam off. He says, wait a minute, you didn't pay me anything. And to his surprise, they both threw silver half dollars down in the bottom of the boat. And he said in the White House so many decades later, I realized then I had earned my first dollar. And I was a more optimistic and hopeful being from that time. That's the kind of economy that Lincoln wanted to create. And in a nutshell, that's why he wasn't a Democrat. Um, the Democrats of that time, everyone that Lincoln grew up around basically was a Democrat, his family, his neighbors. They worshipped Andrew Jackson, this great hero of the backwoods, this great general who's, you know, to be honest, was a a mean SOB. If you imagine someone, God rest his soul, with the personality of the late Senator Arl Inspector, except for he might kill you, okay, that was Andrew um, Jackson. And the Jacksonian Democrats and the Jeffersonian Democrats, they celebrated agrarianism. They romanticized agricultural life. They thought this was a uniquely virtuous uh, way of being. 
Um, and Lincoln just rejected all that. He'd had enough of it growing up. And he goes in a different direction. He becomes a Whig and then a Republican, in part because of this program of development that the Whigs had. Um, if you're not going to have a barter economy, you're going to have something different. You're going to have a cash economy. What do you need? You need banks. If you're not going to be overwhelmingly agricultural for all time, you need industry. They support a tariff to support industry. And if you're going to have a market, you have to have the country knit together. You need canals. You need steamboats. You need railroads. And this gets to the more um, activist view that Lincoln had of government. He supported um, canals and railroads with various forms of government support. But the context of this is very important. Because again, you go back to where Lincoln grew up, there was no way to get goods to market. Okay? If you live near a river, you might possibly be able to get them down the Mississippi and to New Orleans. You would make a handmade raft and you'd float them down. And before you had steamboats, there's no way to get back up, or no good way to get back up. Some people literally walked home. The story is Lincoln's dad made this trip once or twice and walked home. This is not the predicate of a thriving, functioning market. And as soon as railroads touched these hinterlands, then everything changed. Because then you're a farmer, you can buy manufactured goods from the east. Maybe your wife wants some decent clothes, you can buy them from the east. How are you going to buy them? You need cash. How are you going to get cash? You're going to grow for the market. So instantly, people who had been subsistence farmers, who had been growing food just for themselves, become commercial farmers. And they may, may not even grow their own food anymore because that's not the most efficient crop. That's not the best cash crop. So that when you get the railroads there, you instantly get markets where they hadn't existed before. And you get a more diverse economy where there are more means for people to uh, ascend in the world. And that's what Lincoln wanted. And at this time, we didn't have financial markets to speak of. We didn't have angel investors. We didn't have big industrialists. And so you're going to have these big sort of transportation projects. There had to be some level of government support. And, but the ultimate ends was this diverse market. There's another element of the Whig program, very attractive to Lincoln, and that, that was a cultural aspect. It was the insight that to rise in the world, people had to live orderly lives. They had to live disciplined lives. And Lincoln evangelized for this ethic his entire life. When he was a lawyer, people would write to him, aspiring uh, law students, say, how do I become a lawyer? And he would write back things literally, quote, work, work, work is the main thing. Uh, Lincoln's stepbrother stayed in that subsistence world, would oftentimes ask Lincoln for loans. And Lincoln would write back these excoriating, well-intentioned, I suppose, but excoriating letters saying, you're destitute because you're idling away your time. Go to work. That is the only cure for your case. Now, this might have made for awkward Thanksgiving dinners, but it showed you where Lincoln was coming from. And he didn't just evangelize this before this. He lived it. He was a constant, voracious, and stubborn, as one person put it, reader in his youth. And that word stubborn is uh, key, because this was a time when reading wasn't necessarily celebrated. There are quotes from witnesses who lived in that area saying, oh, we didn't think, uh, we thought Lincoln was lazy. He sat around reading and thinking all day. He wasn't good at real work, like going out and killing snakes. Uh, but Lincoln kept reading all the same. And at a time when America was soaked in alcohol, soaked in tobacco, when coarse language was very common in the, and the, the rule, really, I know it sounds like a, a great time, uh, Lincoln didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't chew, he didn't swear. And he loved to tell a story on himself about sharing a railway car with a gentleman from Kentucky. The gentleman offers him a shot of whiskey, no thanks. Offers him a fine cigar, no thanks. Offers him a chew of tobacco, no thanks. And finally, the, the Kentucky gets very frustrated and says, sir, I want to share an insight I have about life. And Lincoln's, OK, please, you know, tell me. And he says, those who have damn few vices have damn few virtues. Uh, but Lincoln didn't smoke or drink or, uh, all the same. And what, what became of this ethic of self-improvement? Well, he made himself a lawyer. And we tend to think of lawyers as parasitic bottom feeders. Uh, present company accepted if we have any fine attorneys in the room. But then lawyers were, were really the shock troops of capitalism and the shock troops of a new capitalist order. And initially, Lincoln wasn't much of a, a lawyer. There's, um, his office was an absolute shambles. There's a story from a former clerk that um, apparently congressmen in that day would, would spread seeds to their constituents, take seeds out. That's kind of like pork barrel projects at the time, I guess. And Lincoln, when he was a congressman, apparently you know, dropped some seeds, was careless with them. And apparently, there was enough dirt in the office 
that an actual a plant sprung up, <laughs> you know, in the corner uh, somewhere. But Lincoln ended up making himself quite a lawyer. He was a corporate lawyer. In fact, he was on retainer for the biggest corporation in the state of Illinois, the Illinois Central Railroad. And if you want to go look at um, Lincoln's fundamental economics, it was all about property rights, patent law. He literally called patent law one of the three greatest inventions of all human history. Uh, Whig and Republican economics de-emphasized class conflict. They basically believe that in a functioning market it shouldn't exist. There isn't any, any such thing as zero-sum economics. And because of that, they opposed uh, redistributionist economics, and they opposed class warfare. And there's just as much of it then as there is now. Lincoln famously told a delegation of working men who came to see him in the White House during the war, let not him who is houseless pull down the house of another. Let him labor diligently and build one of his own. And the fundamental premise of all this is the dignity of labor and the right to the proceeds of your own labor. And when Lincoln was younger, his father, as was his right, hired Lincoln out. Lincoln would go and chop and hoe for neighbors, and his father would take all the money. And Lincoln said about this later, this is self-pitying, this is an exaggeration, but he said, I used to be a slave, which just uh, tells you how deeply he felt um, this, this principle. He um, uh, repeatedly went back and uh, used the, uh, uh, cited the line from Genesis, thou shalt eat thy bread through the sweat of thy brow. Or as Lincoln put it, he who earns the corn should eat the corn. And any violation of this principle was basically an act of theft. And as we saw, he felt it in his personal life. And then more importantly, he felt it when it came to real slavery in the South, which he referred to famously in the second inaugural as unrequited toil. It was a theft of people's labor. And he said this is such a basic principle, such a matter of nature and natural rights, that the very lowest creeping and crawling insect, an ant, knows if it finds a crumb and it works to drag that crumb to its nest, it knows through its labor that crumb now belongs to it. And if you try to take that crumb from the ant, the ant is going to fight you. So there's no way for anyone to misunderstand this principle unless they are doing it willfully, unless they are doing it as a matter of self-interest. And that's what he thought the South was doing. And the South would push back against this kind of critique, and they'd say, OK, yeah, we have human bondage here. But you have wage slaves in the North. You have people you, you pretend to care about, and you, you pay them a little bit of money, but they can't possibly get ahead. And they're worse off than slaves, because you have this man-eat-man -man society and, um, uh, where everyone just has to take care of themselves. Okay, and Lincoln rejected this critique in the marrow of his bones. He said, you know, the genius of our system is that a man who labored for another last year labors for himself this year and goes and hires others to labor for him next year, which is a very succinct statement of the genius of our system. And if you look at Lincoln's um, speeches and his words at this time in the 1850s, his rhetoric is suffused with this profound sense of loss. And it's because he believed the founders had been ashamed of slavery. They tolerated it because there's no easy way to get rid of it. The Constitution tolerated it and protected it, but it doesn't mention it explicitly because it wasn't something to be proud of and something they hoped eventually uh, would go away. And what you had rising up in the South in the 50s was an entirely different attitude towards slavery, an affirmative, a positive defense of slavery, saying this is an institution handed down to us by God, and it is good for the slaves, and it's good for everyone else. And Lincoln <laughs> heard this, and it just broke his heart. And it was a, such shameful backsliding in his mind. He would say things like, our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. Let us repurify it. Let us wash it white in the spirit, if not the blood, of the American Revolution. And um, so he sought a renewal of progress, an enhancement of opportunity. He sought change, but through going back, through going back to the ideals of the founders. And I th think that gets to the essence of the conservatism of his project and should really be the project 
of any conservative in America. We always want to make this country better, but we do it through going back to the founders. And our, we always have a culture that tends to celebrate what's new. Lincoln was unashamed in talking uh, of the founders as those old time men with their old declaration and their old faith that we need to, uh, needed to return to. So here you have this great figure in our history. He believes in a dynamic economy. He believes in individual striving and individual responsibility and rejects class warfare and reveres the founders in fulsome and sometimes even embarrassing terms. And we're supposed to believe that Barack Obama is the heir uh, to this man. It's utterly nonsense. And I, I think the, the important thing about Lincoln and his example for us now is we are experiencing a crisis of opportunity in this country. It is not uh, inequality, which we hear so much about from the left. Inequality is inevitable in a, a free society, but we should be focused on mobility. We like to imagine ourselves as the most open and fluid society in the world. It's not true. You look at measures of mobility, you have Western European countries that are doing better than us. You have other English-speaking countries that are doing better than us. You have Scandinavian countries that are doing better than us. And this has to do with uh, economic trends, but also has to do, in some ways, I think more uh, importantly, uh, with a social breakdown. We are experiencing a breakdown of the family, a breakdown of the work ethic, a breakdown of personal responsibility. All these kind of cultural supports that make it easier for people to get ahead. So I would like to see conservatives focus on an, an updated kind of Lincolnian pr uh, program for our day that would have really a, um, a trinity. One, everything we do can do to make the economy more fluid and dynamic, one. Two, everything we can do to enhance education. We have an education system that's broken in this country, not just K through 12, but uh, college. And then trying to forge a renewal to these basic, of these basic bourgeois virtues. And this is not a matter of Bible thumping. This isn't a matter of moralizing. It's a matter of convincing people that marriage, work, self-improvement, and self-discipline are the ways to get ahead. Uh, in this country. And just one concluding thought, I'll, I'll go back to some Lincoln words once again. He, very early on, before anyone had ever really heard of him, he gave what's called the Lyceum um, Address in Springfield. And there's a passage in that address where he talks about how even though America then was a very weak, immature country, even then it was invulnerable to military assault. He said, you can take all the armies of the world, you can take the greatest general in history, Napoleon, put them at the head of those armies. And that army couldn't take a step on the Blue Ridge Mountains or a, a dip in the Ohio River by force of arms. Then he went on to say, if destruction be our lot, we ourselves must be its author and its finisher. And that is still very true today. And he said, we must, uh, as a uh, nation of free men, we must either live through all time or die by suicide. So my recommendation, ladies and gentlemen, is that we resolve to live. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for four questions. Uh, I think there's some microphones to, to pick up some, uh, if you do have some questions. Um, I might ask the first one. Sure. Uh, from the time of Lincoln to now, where did things go such that there's this debate we have today, and a progressive president uh, can so much embrace Lincoln. How did we get there? Well, um, it's really been something um, progressives have been after for about the, the last 100 years. And for the, for the longest time after the war, it was Republicans. Everyone sort of agreed Republicans get Lincoln, OK? You know, they just get him. Uh, that's fine. Then you have TR breaking away from the Republicans, um, running as a progressive. And it's TR who first says, well, actually, the Republicans are the total opposite of Lincoln. They're everything that Lincoln fought um, in, in his day. You have FDR picking up this argument and running it with it. Um, and you have Obama, who is even more intensely uh, after Lincoln. Uh, you know, famously, he announces his candidacy in front of the old state house in Springfield, takes the oath of, the, of office on uh, the Lincoln Bible. Someone's told me, I'm not sure this figure myself, he's invoked Lincoln 230 times. Um, and th this is very uh, important just because, one, he's inherently a beloved figure. But two, like the, um, our doorman I mentioned, anyone struggling in America and really 
uh, on the initial ladders of success in America is going to identify with Abraham Lincoln. So if we give him up, that's just that's a huge step towards just giving up the value of aspiration to the other side. And the argument they'll, they'll make is because Lincoln supported the railroads, well, then he would have supported every single other government intervention and form of government in all time. And the fact is the break in American history comes with progressivism. It comes with the New Deal. And if you take Lincoln just as we find him, just based on his beliefs then and what he said, and transfer him today and assume no changes, you know, who knows, maybe he would have uh, become a communist. Uh, you know, there was an Abraham Lincoln, communist Abraham Lincoln brigade. Maybe he would have become, I don't know, a lost cause fanatic. There could have been all sorts of changes. But if you take him as you find him, he's much more a fellow traveler with us um, than with them. And uh, he supported a very specific government intervention for a very specific reason. And back then, there wasn't a welfare state. Right? Obama likes to talk about all of government in, in terms of investment and infrastructure. And actually, we do need infrastructure, and most people don't you know, oppose bridges, right? Uh, but it's just that the vast majority of what government does is transfer money from some people to other people. We also have this massive bureaucracy that didn't exist then. The State Department in 1863, I think, had 33 employees. Um, and you had all these regulations uh, now that do so much to hamper development and um, the, the uh, building things in this country. And that's the thing I'm most confident that would be absolutely anathema to Lincoln, just mind-boggling all the obstacles that are put in the way of, of building things. And this is one reason why we have all this great infrastructure spending, right, in 2009. And what do we have to show for it? You know, we have some guardrails somewhere. But there's nothing big. There's nothing that's going to enhance the economic efficiency of the country because you can't build that stuff uh, quickly in this country anymore. So it's been a long-term um, project of the left, and it's based on a, a, a misunderstanding, I believe, of, of Lincoln and his views of government. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I agree with you 100 percent that um, we have to kind of popularize hard work and uh, to get ahead an opportunity. And I just wondered if you could um, address how can you change people's goals and their ideas of norms, and what do you do about a system that sometimes make, uh, makes honest work less profitable? For instance, um, if you work, you get the same amount of money no matter how many kids you have. But if you uh, are in government assistance, you might get more money for each child and, and things like that in the system. Yeah, well, um, I guess two things. One, how do we change the culture and the mores of the country is, is a really big question. And I don't have an easy answer for it. And I think on a lot of this stuff, unfortunately, it would help a lot if Republicans just talked about it more than they do. Um, and realize you know, the fiber of people as, as, is as important or really more important than marginal tax rates. <laughs> I mean, the fiber of people is really important. But I, I think if things like marriage, if you're going to see um, a cultural shift on it, um, we really need Democrats to, to talk about it. Because we're going to uh, talk about it, we're viewed as judgmental and moralistic and ridiculous. But if, you, if Barack Obama would talk about it, it would make more of a difference. And his Morehouse speech was quite good. It's just this isn't a speech that any, anymore you should just go and talk to a, a group of African American men about. You should talk to everyone um, about it. And, and I think if you sell it in terms of aspiration and as an aid to aspiration, it's much more appealing. And one of the things that's heartening on the one hand but disturbing on the other is if you divide the country up into thirds by level of education, college educated, um, p folks with a college degree being the top third, they have figured this out. You know, they lead a version of a kind of leave it to beaver kind of lifestyle. Um, uh, the illegitimacy rate among those people is like 6%. It's 6%. Then you take the middle. And this is a huge difference between our time and Reagan's time. In 1982, the illegitimacy rate among that middle, high school degrees, some college, but not a college degree, kind of the real solid middle American working class. It was 14% in 1982, it's 44% now. And on all sorts of measures like that, you see the middle sliding to where the, the lower end is. And that's where you're going to get a real class divide that's going to become unbridgeable. And we'll still be called, a country called America, we'll still be rich, we'll still be powerful, but we, we won't be the America we were or 
should be. And I had a second thought on your question, but it got so worked up, I forgot, I forgot what it was. Oh, Thank well, you. you have to, sorry, you have to reform the welfare programs as well to end, end those incentives that you're talking about. Yes, sir, sorry. I agree with what you said on page 180 about the Confederate. So I hope everyone else read the book as carefully as this <laughs> discerning gentleman. About the Confederacy's pioneering uh, preceding Wilson. But my question is, uh, Lincoln was an attorney for the Illinois Central, but you talk about how Stephen Douglas rode in the palace car on yeah. the Illinois Central at probably no cost. Yeah. How do you, how, what was the background on that? Yeah, okay, that's a great, a, a great question. Um, with, with Stephen Douglas, uh, well, one, it's just the relationship between the two is fascinating because they knew each other as young men coming up. And the story is that actually Stephen Douglas flirted with Mary Todd before she uh, married Lincoln. And there's this note that Lincoln wrote to himself in the 1850s after his only term in Congress. He goes back to Illinois. He has no political prospects to speak of. Whigs don't. You're not elected to statewide office in Illinois as a Whig. And he, he writes this note about how here's Stephen Douglas. I've known him 23 years. He's very ambitious. I may be more ambitious than he is. And he's world famous. He's a senator everyone knows. And he's a potential presidential candidate. He is a great success in the race of life. And I'm a flat failure. And just the, the incredible turnabout that happened, you know, in the years after he wrote that is in itself an amazing story. But Douglas believed in railroads, too. And one of the reasons that he forged the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which uh, was a horrible tragedy for, for the country, is he just wanted the South to go along with a, trans, uh, a, trans, a route for the transcontinental railroad. And the key difference between Lincoln and Douglas uh, is not necessarily the... Um, uh, the way they viewed the potential of the country and its development, it came down to a matter of principle. And do we have natural rights that exist for all time and should be honored uh, in all circumstances or not? And Douglas said, no, we don't. The Declaration was just for Englishmen and white people. And Lincoln said, no, it's for everyone. And at the, the onset of that campaign, he had a wonderful speech in Chicago saying, let's put away all this quibbling about who's inferior uh, or who's superior and just come back to those magical words, all men are created equal. Now, he backslid a little bit in the debates under the relentless race baiting of um, Douglas. So, but Lincoln and Douglas, in some ways, are very similar uh, guys, except for I think Douglas is both very ambitious. They both had this grand vision of the development of the country, but Link, uh, Douglas was a little more opportunistic, and um, Lincoln had a more logical cast of mind. You know, he referred to the Declaration of Independence as the definitions and axioms of a free society, and he said, yes, we got to develop, but it's not worth developing, and we can't really develop the way we want to unless we're true to those things, and that, that was the big difference um, between them, that was, and it was played out in the debates. Pat, is there one of those uh, right-wingers that thinks Lincoln is definitely an agent or a pr the proto-left, you could definitely say? Um, and I'd like to respectfully challenge you on it. Please. Um, given that Lincoln violated the civil rights of, or the civil liberties of thousands of Northerners and Southerners, and that he centralized power in Washington and used the military and the federal government as an agent of social progressive change, does that not, in fact, prove that he is, in fact, a proto-leftist and almost more or less mirrors the policies of Barack Obama's big government, the National Defense Authorization Act, and so forth, that you can imprison people indefinitely, and so on and so forth. He sounds far more like an agent of the left than anything of the traditional American right. Okay. Let, let me, before I start, let me challenge you. How, how is Jefferson Davis on civil liberties and economic liberty? Well, I think the fact that he still respects states' rights unto itself is the prime issue. Did he favor a federal um, Fugitive Slave Act? He did. Yeah. Did he favor a federal slave code in the territories? That's right. Yeah, it's funny, isn't I'm, it? I'm not did, he suspend Davis, Hab though. did he suspend habeas corpus, Jefferson Davis? Yes, he did. Oh, yeah, wow. Did he have a draft? Yes, that's right. Did he have an income tax? That's right. A progressive income tax? With all due respect, we're not talking even about more, Even more, why, even, why aren't we? But you, so you oppose Jefferson Davis more than you do Lincoln? No, I oppose President oh, Lincoln more. Oh, you, you, you oppose Lincoln more, even but, though Davis was guilty of all the same things that you think are so horrible about true, Lincoln. That is but the difference is, is that President Davis peacefully withdrew from the Union, and Lincoln used wait, wait, forces so who, to kill millions of Americans. Who shot first? Together. 
Well, of course, the South shot first, but only on provocative provocative from the, the North. A resupplying force. Okay, well, it wasn't we're going to have a big argument place. here. So <laughs> let me let me. Uh, it was South Carolina's uh, for it. Let me address a couple of the things. C civil liberties. He does suspend habeas corpus, which is in the Constitution, Article One, Section Nine, insurrection. Um, and I think in the initial circumstances where he suspends it, it's very understandable. You have a, a Washington that's unprotected, has no troops to speak of, and you have them coming down through the north, and they get blocked by this uh, pro-Confederate mobs in Baltimore. So it suspends along the line from Philadelphia to Washington. Um, and Congress eventually blesses that retrospectively. Because the dispute really is not whether you can suspend habeas corpus, it's whether it's congressional power or presidential power. What I think you can hold against Lincoln is then the suspensions become routine. They cover the entire North. And I think that went too far. There were abuses. But the most careful scholarship on uh, this matter that is, isn't act, uh, grinding axes and coming at it from an per inherent perspective of hatred of Lincoln says that most of the people caught up in these military trials, they were blockade runners, they were people evading the drafts, uh, they were guerrilla warriors in places like Missouri where you had um, you know, a civil war within in the state, an irregular war. Um, so the abuses were fairly minimal. Um, and then you just, this fundamental dispute I think comes down to is secession legitimate? You know, is there a right to secession in the Constitution? And I just think uh, there wasn't. And it wasn't just me. You know, it was James Madison who thought there wasn't. It was not, the Constitution was not something like the Lisbon Treaty that puts together the EU, which has Article 50, where you're sovereign nation and you can leave if you want. Um, what anyone has and what the South had was the right to revolution. That is a fundamental natural right of people. But as the Constitution says, there has to be a long train of abuses where your natural rights are being violated. And then you have a revolution that's legitimate and moral and just. The South, no one was violating anyone's natural rights in the South except for the slave owners. And if you read the uh, declarations of secession from the initial southern states, they're all about slavery. In fact, they even complain about the very existence of abolitionists in the North criticizing slavery. And of course, they blocked, they're very committed to freedom, but they blocked the, abol the abolitionist literature from coming in uh, to the South because they feared the very criticism. So the South seceded, in my view, illegitimately because there was no uh, right to secede. And their revolution was unjust and wrong because it was based on trying to preserve their right to violate the natural rights of other people. And such a right does not exist in this country or any other. Okay, other, other questions? Right here. Um, hi. Uh, Ken Masugi. Uh, uh, you might also add that the, no one in the South could vote for Lincoln since he wasn't allowed to be on the ballot. Uh, Details. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, my question deals with Lincolnian rhetoric today. Uh, and, of course, he could appeal to the King James Bible, as he did in, in the Gettysburg Address, among other places. Um, and is there, so how should a Lincolnian speak today? I, I've taught Lincoln many times, and you always have to remind people of what he's appealing to in the souls of his audience. So what... Obviously, hard work, as you pointed out, can be uh, one of those uh, one of those great themes that Americans respect. But uh, that sounds too much like cutting taxes and micro incentives and that sort of thing. Uh, that's not what made Lincoln the beloved figure, the, the very powerful figure he is. So, what? Yeah. Well, a, c a couple things occurred to me. I'm not sure I have a good answer for your question. One, obviously with Lincoln, he's not an Orthodox Christian by any means, but he's soaked in the Bible. He loves Shakespeare. These readers that kids were given in um, these one-room classrooms are just incredibly rich literary resources that have you know, the excerpts from the best novels ever written, excerpts of the best speeches you know, ever delivered by Americans. So this incredibly rich, a rich rhetorical resource. He reads those. And then he's an amateur poet. So he's someone who really cares about the music of words. And if you take that musicality 
and you join it to the, the deepest and profoundest ideals uh, in the country, well then you get speeches that echo down throughout the ages and always will. I think the, those founding ideals are still in the DNA of the country and can still be appealed to. Lincoln, a uh, famous speech, referred to them as an electric cord, you know, connecting everyone, even people who weren't born here, to uh, the founding and to our ideals. So I, I still think um, invoking them and going back to them uh, has a, a lot of power, even if it's attenuated in our age, where the power of words is attenuated. Now, you know, we're um, a country of visual images, and the power of words have been degraded, but it's, it's still there, and um, it behooves anyone who wants to um, move the country in the way Lincoln did to, to go back to those ideals. What else? Yes, sir. This is just a comment, and it sort of relates to your your, your previous uh, uh, your your previous answer to this gentleman's uh, uh, question. Uh, I was walking down the street, and I was trying to figure out why an editor of the National Review, who was just covers so many different issues, would write a uh, uh, a book, a whole book on on Lincoln. And then after your speech, all of a sudden, I realized why you wrote that book on Lincoln because we have a problem with cultural supports, and you've taken an iconic figure and then hooked that up with. Uh, this cultural problem that we have today. And uh, I just want to congratulate you because I think that, that was, that's quite a feat. And you certainly have answered my question as, as I was walking down the street. See, that's how good I am. I pre-answer your question before, <laughs> before you ask. No, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. <laughs> yeah, um, it's fine. Great. You know, it just occurred to me that um, I'm wondering if kind of the, the, the fact that Lincoln, what motivated him was his early days having to deal with natural issues. The natural world is very competitive, um, and it seemed to instill in him that sense of competition and fairness that only the natural world can uh, compel people to do. Um, but is that self-sustaining? Because what he strove for was just the opposite, it seems to me. And as you do progress away from that natural world and uh, get away from that competitiveness, we're almost at the epitome of, epitome of that today. And it has been kind of a gradual migration from, you know, the basics. And in today's world, we have most children, I, well, I, I would venture to say, never deal with the natural world. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Again, I'm not sure whether I have a, a great answer for you. I'm better at pre-answering questions than answering uh, <laughs> real live questions. Um, yeah, the, in terms of the competitiveness, it, uh, just a phrase he used over and over again is the race, the race of life. And he gave, uh, there's a little talk he gave to um, the 166 Ohio Regiment during the war. And he says, I, I always like to tell troops a little something about why we're fighting this. Because we have these three institutions that guarantee everyone equal privileges for their industry, intelligence, talent, work in the race of life. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily a natural thing in the sense that it's connected to animals and forests and all that. I think it's inherent to human nature. And I, I do believe that most people understand in some deep sense, maybe it's buried and increasingly buried in our world and the kind of government um, we have, but the pursuit of happiness involves earned success, right? You, you may think it's great when someone gives something to you, and it may be satisfying in the short term, and it enables your laziness, and we all have our lazy side, but you're only really happy when you're making the most of your talents and you're getting recognized for it. And that's what and the, dec the Declaration calls the pursuit of happiness. And I think people still believe that. And even though we have more and more people dependent on government, you know, you listen to a democratic uh, convention like we had a year ago, do they celebrate government dependence? No. I mean, it's all celebrating the things they support in these terms we're talking about uh, here. So I think that that uh, that ember still exists in the in this country, and we just got to blow on it and stoke on it, uh, stoke it, and do everything we can to keep it alive and grow it. I think conservatives, by and large, still do a pretty good job of preaching the hard work and opportunity and earned success message 
Uh, the country has, however, considerably softened up, and everybody's a victim, everybody's miserable, yeah. everybody needs help. And I think one area where we need help is to better talk about how we'd help people who really are down on their luck beyond telling them to get a job. Would Lincoln offer any advice to us today on how to be, I hate using this word, but more compassionate? Um, because we already own the entrepreneurship thing. We need help with helping yeah. others. Yeah, that's, that's also a great point. I think on the entrepreneurship, yeah, we own entrepreneurship. But the fact of the matter is the number of people who are really going to be entrepreneurs is very small. And you need to uh, let everyone else know that they have a place, an honored place in your imagination as well. The people who are just, how can they get a little uh, ahead and how can, especially can their kids uh, get ahead. So I think we made a lot of hay of the you didn't build it gaff from Obama, but I think we made hay of it in a way that most people um, don't really connect with, you know? So I think that's part of it. Also, um, I think a, a lesson from Lincoln and also a lesson from Reagan is just there is no substituting trying to be persuasive and winsome. And Lincoln said in a speech famously, a drop of honey attracts more flies than a gallon of gall. And I also think we do really good on the gall part. <laughs> we have a lot to be galled back about, frankly, right? So it's understandable. But we need a little bit more of that honey. And this is something Reagan um, did as well. You know, Reagan didn't run by saying I'm a Reagan Republican. You know, he didn't run saying I'm an ideological conservative. He said, no, I'm running because we have serious problems in this country that are affecting ordinary people. You got gas lines, you have inflation, you have high interest rates, you have bracket creep in the tax system, and I have a policy to address every single one of those. Now, all the policies, as they should have, were through a, a conservative, limited government um, uh, principles, but they, they connected very concretely with people. I look at my own family. They weren't Reagan Republicans. Um, I think they may have, to their shame, voted for Jimmy Carter in 76, but the price of chicken was too high, right? They didn't like standing, um, sitting in li line um, for gas. So he connected with ordinary people and their struggles, and that's what I think conservatism needs to uh, do again today. And, you know, we all love Reagan Democrats, but what were they before they were Reagan Democrats? They were Democrats. So you need to reach people who are um, um, outside your normal ambit. And it involves being persuasive and winsome and really fo asking genuinely, um, sincerely, what are their problems and how do you address them? Uh, well, with that, uh, Rich, uh, I'd like to thank you. The book is uh, Lincoln Unbound. We have copies here. I certainly encourage it. Also, you can find uh, Rich's work in the pages of National Review and National Review Online, which are both uh, very good uh, sources of these ideas. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks very happy that. to have you here. Thank Appreciate you all for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.